Well, it's Wednesday night, so I'm joined now from Sydney by your favourite my favourite, the gentleman genius himself, broadcaster Kill Richards. We've got some goodies tonight, haven't we, Kill? A few pronunciations, a few words we want to pull apart and decipher the meaning of. And of course, when I said last week, please go to Kill's website, you were inundated. Credible viewers uh, love throwing you su some suggestions. I've got some good ones. Without further ado, let's get into them. Sanction, the meaning of sanction. Well, sanction came into English from uh, Latin via French in 1570, and it originally came into English simply meaning law or decree. Now, a law or decree can either uh, allow for something or prevent something. It can be for something or against something. So in other words, sanction, like a law or decree, is itself neutral. So you can have a, a, a law which says it's OK to do this or a law that says it's not OK to do that. Um, so... It's a, it's a neutral term in the middle. It can be used either way. You know, you've been granted a sanction to do this or there's a sanction against Russia. So it is, it is neutral, law or decree. By the way, Peter, would I, would I get into mm. trouble if I said, happy birthday? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. But when <laughs> you get over 50, we don't have so many happy... Oh, the, I was going to say, but, we don't have that many happy birthdays, but it is better than the alternative, as my late father would always say. <laughs> And I think with, uh, you know, Kimberly Kitching and others dying so young, I'm going to celebrate every moment. Uh, Absolutely. Proof of the pudding. I always, I always thought this was proof of the pudding is in the eating, but, but so often it's now proof of the pudding. Am I wrong? Yeah, you're exactly right. You're on the money. Now, now, Chris Kenny is a brilliant journalist and I love his work, but last Friday, Chris said, the proof is in the pudding. What's happened is that familiar expression that you know and I know has been compacted down to a shorter version and the shorter version doesn't actually make sense. The older version that you and I remember, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, is using the word proof in the older sense of test. In other words, the test of the pudding is in the eating. And when you put it like that, you think, of course it is. That's how you test a pudding. Is it any good or not? You eat it. Uh, so, but that contraction is happening more and more. I mean, recently someone was referred to as having gone above and beyond. Well, above and beyond on itself mm. means nothing. Uh, the, that's a shorter version of the real expression, which is above and beyond the call of duty. So you've got to be wary and to understand the full idiom, the full proverbial expression that lies behind these things. Right. One, uh, one of my viewers was very interested in is the phrase played off a break comes from uh, tabletop games like snooker and pool, and I've wasted a lot of hours playing snooker and pool. You start the game with all the balls in a rack on the table, all bunched together, and the first shot has to break the bunched-up balls. Now, you can get a bad break or a good break. If it's a good break and the balls spread over the table and are hovering over the pockets... But the person who played that shot hasn't sunk a ball, then it goes to his opponent, who's got a really good break uh, and who will sink ball after ball, bang, 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 into pocket after pocket. He has played his opponent off a break. He's got it. When you talk about someone having a... If you, things have gone well, you say, oh, I've had a lucky break. It's the same metaphor. It's the same image from the same game. If you get a good break, if the balls are just hanging out on the edge of the pockets, then you can play one shot after another and you've played him off a break. I tell you what, uh, one of the reasons I had to, you know, spend a fair amount of longer time at university, I love that pool table as well. So there you go. One thing we've got in common amongst many other things. Uh, pronunciations. I think this is my biggest gripe with language and people in the media. I know I'm not always perfect. I, tr I try to do as good a job as I can. Uh, schedule, schedule. The big problem is it's a living language. It, it's not a pond, it's a river. It's flowing and changing all the time. And, in fact, people have always got stressed about pronunciations. I'm reading a brilliant book at the moment by a linguist called David Crystal called The Fight for English. And he points out how in the 16th century, in the 1500s, they were having exactly the same debates and discussions and uh, concerns we've got. Now, in the case of schedule, it is, it's on the cusp of change. Professor Pam Peters, before she retired at Macquarie University, actually did a study. She got some of her graduate students to survey how people pronounced it. Did they say schedule or did they say schedule? And what Pam discovered was almost everyone under 40 says schedule 
almost everyone over 40 says schedule. So this is a generational thing. I mean, you and I have lost the battle on this one. Schedule was the standard British and Australian pronunciation. Schedule was the American pronunciation. We've simply heard it too often. And the kids have, they've just taken over. It's now schedule. And we have to shrug our shoulders and say we've lost that battle. But can I say, I'm not giving in. I will keep saying schedule no, until the no, end. No, I'm not either. Yep, yep. Uh, so, well, and, privacy and, well, the, or privacy, that's another one. Privacy or privacy. And it's exactly the same thing. Uh, it is one of these things which is right on the cusp of change. Uh, now, if you look at the Oxford English Dictionary, they give you... I, I have the online version so I can actually hear pronunciations. And they say there are two British pronunciations acceptable, privacy and privacy, but they prefer privacy. In America, there's only one pronunciation, which is privacy. And this one again, like schedule and schedule, has shifted over our lifetime and privacy's gone uh, and privacy's taken over. Now, I can understand why. The logic of the thing is, well, private has a long eye vowel, so we should say privacy with a long eye vowel. That's the way it's gone. Uh, it's, it's, it is difficult for those of us who remember the way it was said and the way we think, we still think it should be said. But we've got to accept it's a living language and just as in the 1500s, mm -hmm. we, we will have a battle with the next generation. Uh, there's a lovely comment from someone in about 1560 who says a grandfather can no longer understand his grandchildren, right? Because the changes in English are always going to happen and schedule and uh, privacy, privacy are examples of exactly that happening. Well, it used to be my day, though. Your grandparents would pull you up and they'd want to school you on uh, correct pronunciation and you always wanted to get it right. I think now they gra grandparents uh, pull up grandkids and they cop an earful from the grandkids. And I, you know, I think that's the, that's the shame. That's the shame. Anyway, Kel, there'll be more for you next week. I can hear the, the computers going that my viewers are sending them your way. We'll come back to it next week. Pronunciations and anything else people want to know. Love you here on Wednesday as always.